Hello everybody. The current EV marketplace is a little bit like the Wild West. Ten years ago, it seems that anyone buying an EV was a bit of an oddity, a bit of a weirdo, some sort of lifty, liberal, kind of planet-saving eco-warrior. However, now it seems that electric cars aren't just here, they are here to stay. And with all manufacturers realizing that there is gold in then our hills, they of course all want a slice of the pie. And so today we are looking at this, Audi's all new e-tron, their first attempt at the pure electric car. Now, many brands have used this step change in technology to introduce brand new, bold and exciting design languages. After all, the simple concept of an EV means that designers are now free in a way that they haven't been for a very long time to design cars. Believe it or not, this is actually a brand new car. Okay, some of the underpinnings are shared with other vehicles, but none directly. This sits between the Q5 and the Q7 in terms of size, and let's be honest here, if I didn't tell you, you really wouldn't know that it was anything special. The only giveaways are the light bar at the rear, the fancy wheels here, and a slightly different looking grill. But otherwise, Audi's vision of the future does look an awful lot like every other Audi, doesn't it? And I suppose their logic is this. They want something that people can buy and use and drive just like any other Audi. They want to have an easy electric car, an easy ownership experience. They want to make the transition as smooth and as comfortable for people as they possibly can. And I can sympathize. Coming from a film and TV background, I saw the same thing happening when we moved from film to digital. Some companies chose to make cameras that were totally different and wild and out there and, and completely unlike anything we'd ever seen before. But the manufacturers which were popular were the ones that made their digital cameras work just like the old ones always did. It's a different approach, but I can congratulate Audi on being, I suppose, a little bit brave by not being brave. There are, however, a couple of small innovations that I do like about the car. The e-tron has been designed to work with the next generation of charging ports that are being rolled out through the country, meaning that this car can charge at speeds of up to 150 kilowatts. Uh, that's about triple the speed of some of the last generation electric cars, meaning that in theory you can charge the car from nothing in under an hour, or up to 80%, which is what's you know, a fairly useful guideline for these things, in about half an hour. Uh, there aren't many of those charging ports around at the moment, but the network is growing quite rapidly. Audi believe that about 60% of all charging is going to happen at home. And whilst I could believe a statistic like that in somewhere like the United States, well, here that's just not going to be the reality, especially in crowded cities, which is the place where EVs, I think, are most needed. A solution is still required for people charging in town, and that's something that I addressed in my last big rant about electric cars. However, one small thing that Audi have done is give you a charging port on each side of the car. Annoyingly, it's only on this side that you can access the fast charging socket. Uh, that side is just the regular AC, which you can also run off domestic or for a wall socket, anything like that. I do like the fact that it's no longer at the front of the car. However, many charging ports in the country have been set up for cars with access at the front. And that means that getting the cable to reach this can occasionally be a struggle. It's quite clear to me that when people were designing electric car charging bays, they were expecting a Nissan Leaf and not a bus like this. You might also notice the fact that this car has normal wing mirrors. And I say that because the e-tron has introduced some special new digital virtual wing mirrors, which sort of ditch this and you get a small little flat blade with a camera on it and then two extra screens inside. Unfortunately, this press car doesn't have it. Audi have fixed one of my major small but important gripes with the previous two electric cars that I've driven, which were both Kias. Those cars chuck all the basic charging cables under the boot, which is a very bad place to put them because you need them fairly frequently, or I certainly do, and then you have to chuck all your stuff out to be able to get to them. Audi instead stick them in a far more sensible place up the front. That is if I can ever learn how to open the thing properly. You've got a couple of basic charging cables in here, your tyre inflation kit if you get a flat, and underneath here you have one of the car's two electric motors. They produce in tandem about 265 kilowatts of power or about 300 kilowatt in overboost mode. In normal car terms, that translates to about 350 horsepower or 400 when you've got your foot flat in sporty mode. Between the two axles, you have an enormous 700 kilo battery pack 
which has a capacity of about 93 kilowatt hours. The real usable capacity is a little bit less than that. The way electric cars work means that they never let themselves get fully charged or fully drained, and that's one thing that helps prolong their life. It is in here where the car is perhaps its most conventional. If you didn't know what it was, the only real giveaways are the fact that it says e-tron over there and has a new design for the gear shifter down here. Other than that, it's business as usual for a modern Audi, which is to say it's mostly very good. The highlights are without a doubt these two screens at the top here. This car is equipped with Audi's Virtual Cockpit Plus, which is an absolutely fantastic system and easily the best of its kind that I have used. Really, as far as I'm concerned, this screen should render all others totally redundant because you can do basically anything through it, or you should be able to. It's nice, it's clear, easy to use, I was very, very hesitant to like these things, but actually having spent a fair bit of time in Audi's equipped with them now, I really do love them. The second and central screen here as a new item has just been rolled out across the range. Very clear, very high res, easy to read, easy to use. It is touchscreen, which I don't like. Audi have ditched their nice MMI interface, which I, I really was a fan of, but if you're gonna have a touchscreen, that is as good as they can possibly be. The one screen I have real issue with is the third one, the newest of the family, which is down here. And this replaces all of the old HVAC controls and a few other things. I simply don't understand the logic of a company that spends so much time and effort engineering all these brilliant safety and you know, crash avoidance systems into a car, but then design something that means you have to take your eyes off the road to adjust the temperature in the cabin. That just makes no sense whatsoever. And that added to the fact that you have lots of this piano black stuff in here and glossy screens that you're meant to touch means that this interior is already full of fingerprints after only a few days. Yes, I know the rest of the car is filthy, but that's because I have been using this. I'm not one of these journalists who just gets a car, puts it on the driveway and looks at it for a bit and then sends it back. I really do put a lot of miles on these cars and I've put about four or 500 on this car already and that's in the first two days and I've got more to go. So there may be a second video from me on this car in the near future because I have had some issues that haven't been e-tron specific and so I don't want to talk about those in this. What is e-tron specific though is this stuff. And this stuff is important. This car has the optional upgraded sport seats in Valcona leather in gray. Now it's already starting to fade on the driver's side. The leather itself is nice and soft and quite plush, but I have a bit of a problem with this interior. For a 40 or 50 grand A4, it, it'll be fine. This is not a 40 or 50 grand A4. This is a very expensive car. This has a starting price of 71,000 pounds and this exact car as tested is closer to 88,000 quid. Now I appreciate the fact that Audi have resisted temptation to try and make this a sort of very typical electric car and it's got all the features that you would think might be deleted from an EV. For example, this big opening panoramic sunroof up here. I love a good sunroof and it's a seriously heavy piece of glass. So for someone trying to make an EV and trying to make it more efficient, that'd be the first thing you get rid of. The same with the power folding tailgate at the rear, but they're all still here present and correct because Audi know that's what their customers expect. But I think for 88 grand, the interior in here just needs to feel a little bit nicer. The seats are fine. The steering wheel is okay. I prefer the S and RS wheels, but I understand why this car doesn't have one of those. However, this stuff on the dash top, and here, it's not good enough. Audi will sell you an extended leather pack for about 900 pounds, and that should just be standard. Come on, guys. This is your electric future. This is a premium product. And as you'll see later on, the stats of the car aren't really impressive enough to sell it on its own. For me, the way Audi should have marketed this is as the luxury electric car. Because if you've ever been in a Tesla, they're not great. The Model S inside just feels cheap. And Audi had a real opportunity here to create the first nice but affordable, relatively speaking, electric car with a cool interior. And they just missed the boat on that one. To run you through the optional extras on this car that make up that sort of 17 grand price differential, the Galaxy Blue color, which is very nice, 750 pounds. The sporty seats, two grand. Those 21 inch turbine design alloy wheels, 950 quid. Comfort, remo comfort remote preconditioning, 100, 100 pounds. 
soft closed doors, 675, heads up display, which is very nice. Again, should be standard, 1450. A wall bracket for your charger, 150 quid. Storage and luggage pack, which is a couple of nets throughout the car, that's 125. City assist pack, uh, tour pack there, 1125 and 1950. They've got things like your pre-sense, uh, adaptive cruise control, that sort of stuff. Matrix LED headlights, they are very good, 1350. Privacy glass, 475. Audi music interface in the back, 175 quid. Uh, body color bumpers and illuminated door sills, that's 175 quid. Uh, acoustically glazed side windows, and the car is reasonably quiet actually. 525 pounds, electric steering column, 425. Air quality pack, 425. That panoramic roof, 1475. Uh, black roof rails, 425 quid. It's a bit stingy. I assume that means that you get the roof rails, they don't just paint them black for 400 quid, I hope. The Presense rear package, that's the seat belts that, that tighten you and grab you, uh, that's another 700 quid. Cloth headlining in black, 350, why that's charged I don't know. Tire pressure monitoring system, again should be standard, 325. Four zone deluxe climate control, 825. Virtual cockpit plus, which is I think just a slightly better, clearer, higher resolution display here, 125. 360 degree camera, 725, although that is part of another pack. Uh, the, the way Audi specs some of their press cars doesn't make a lot of sense. The way you buy one of these, you probably wouldn't have half these options on, they just come bundled as packs. And then the comfort and sound pack, which comes with things like the B&O stereo that's pretty average 1895 and that brings you with your road fund license your first registration fee all that sort of stuff well road fund license is free uh, at uh, 87890 I think they should have just made it 90 grand for all of them chuck everything in there and make the interior way nicer that's that's my opinion anyway to drive, the e-tron is actually very nice. Probably my favorite electric car so far. It does genuinely just feel like a big normal Audi. And that means that I'm going to judge it differently to how I would many other cars. This clearly has no intentions of being very sporty whatsoever, or well, if it does, it, it fails massively. This is one of my favorite test roads. It's the exact kind of road that you can use to demonstrate just how brilliant a hot hatchback can be. This is not the natural environment for a large 4x4, but this car is doing exactly what any good 4x4 should do. It's giving me a great view of the road ahead and it is supremely comfortable. This is actually an excellent wafty car, aided by the fact that it is reasonably quiet, even with those fairly large front EV tires on it. This acoustic glazing is maybe doing its job, I really don't know, but this is a lovely place to spend a bit of time. All of the interfaces and things, apart from the silly HVAC setup down here, work very nicely indeed. The heads-up display is bright and clear and easy to use, and the car does its job very well. The steering, of course, has absolutely no feel whatsoever, but a reasonable amount of weight, and that is absolutely fine. I really don't mind in this kind of car. Throttle response is actually pretty good. Pulling away from a standstill, the car doesn't shoot off the line like you'd expect in an electric car too, even one with a 0 to 60 time of under six seconds. It's very smooth in the way that it moves off, even with very heavy right foot. But when you are on the move, it responds brilliantly. This is the instantaneous throttle response that people promise me you get with an electric car. And up to about 80 or 90 miles an hour, it picks up speed at a very impressive rate. The car, as you might expect, has a plethora of different drive modes. The reality is that only about two of them are any use at all. You've got stuff like efficiency mode, which in my mind is just dangerous. It doesn't give you any extra range, it just blunts the throttle to the point where it's, well, problematic. Comfort is exactly what it says on the tin. Dynamic is basically pointless. It makes the steering unnecessarily heavy but adds no feel and it lowers the car which is on air suspension as standard and therefore just ruins the ride a little bit. You have an off-road mode which raises the car up a bit and I suppose if you do live down a dirt track or something like that, that is the only other mode you're probably going to use with any sort of regularity. Fortunately, there is an individual setting where you can tailor things to your own personal preferences, but there isn't an awful lot that you can set in there with this car, of course, not having a traditional engine or anything like that. However, there is one very large elephant in the room with regards to the e-tron, and that is the fact that it basically weighs the same as an elephant. This car 
fully loaded is about 2.6 tons. It is half a ton heavier than not only Audi's own SQ7, the I-Pace, the Model X, they are all considerably lighter. Audi have suffered from their decision to build this car on an existing platform. The next generation promises to have its own standalone platform to use. For Audi, who have been pioneering in their use of aluminium to achieve lighter weights in their cars, this is not very good, to be honest. That added weight has some serious consequences. This car's claimed electric range is about 230 miles, and that's under the new regs, so I thought that was going to be a somewhat realistic estimate. Unfortunately, that's not the case. In my time with this car to date, I've got the charge up to about 95%, but at no point in time has the car told me it's ever had anything more than about 190 miles of range in the tank, so to speak. That's not good. The first electric car that I drove, the Kia Soul EV, had a range of about 110 miles in the real world. And the second that I drove, the E Nero, had a range of over 230. And that was a car, again, where I never actually managed to achieve a full charge because of the way that I was using it that week. This one, I hope, would be basically similar to the E Nero, but it just isn't. No matter how much things change, they always stay the same, it would seem. Because this car, by being heavy, four-wheel drive, all that jazz, is not very efficient. The e Nero, I was achieving something in the region of about four miles per kilowatt hour of energy. In this, my record so far is 2.2 miles. And at the present time, I'm achieving only 1.5 miles. What that means is that you're not getting as much from a tank for the same amount of energy, much like in a traditional combustion engine vehicle. However, my 7 Series as an example, which has an 88 litre tank versus, let's just say, a small hot hatch with a 40 or 50 litre tank, yes, of course, it costs more to fill, but in practical terms, only takes about an extra minute or so to do. Well, this because it has to have a larger battery pack to provide you with the same range, takes about 50% longer to do everything versus the Kia e Nero. And that is rather unfortunate. There is so much that I like about this car, but if I'm being brutally honest about it, and I have to be because I need to be honest about these reviews, otherwise you'll stop watching them. I can't quite work out a single reason why one should buy the e-tron over any of its other electric rivals at the price point that they're asking you could get into tesla model s ownership if that's your bag and that car's got more power and more range granted not as nice inside as this and i don't like the way tesla do their things but it's a popular car and it comes with all the added benefits of being a tesla like the supercharger network etc etc the Jaguar I-Pace is perhaps the most similar to this, and that, for the same money, again, gets more range and has a much nicer interior to it, although I have yet to drive that car to see how it compares in other matters, but on paper, it doesn't look too good. This is also considerably more expensive than the Kia e-Nero or the Hyundai Kona Electric, and those are cars which will get you more range for less than half the money. There are two ways that Audi could have saved the e-tron as far as I'm concerned. First off, you need to give it a USP. You need to have something that you can only get if you buy the e-tron, certainly in terms of electric cars anyway. I think for Audi, the easiest and most obvious thing would have been to have given it a nice interior. Give it the sort of thing that you'd get from an A8. Audi can do some amazing world-class interiors and there are bits of this interior that are still leagues ahead of their competition, but the others have moved the game on. Even people like Kia are doing decent interiors now. No, not as nice as this one, of course, but they are a hell of a lot better than they were. BMW and the 5 Series are making some seriously nice cars, and they historically were never that good at interiors. Mercedes, for all the things that they do wrong, also make some seriously nice places to be, and this just isn't quite good enough. Why is that optional leather pack an option, just chuck it in here. Guys, it's not gonna cost you a lot of money, just make it nice. It's clear that Audi weren't that worried about making this a sort of, you know, vegan type person's car. 
I've driven a few electric cars where they've gone for the whole sort of green thing and they go for the sort of ethically no animal product interior and I totally understand that but there's enough leather in here to put off any sort of die-hard animal lover so just go the whole hog or the whole cow as the case may be and just chuck some more stuff in here just make it feel like the premium product that it is supposed to be Audi are very proud of their position as one of the most desirable premium brands in the United Kingdom but I think they need to realize that that is a position they will only keep with continued hard work and a little bit of Vorsprung durch quality lads okay the other and perhaps simpler thing they could have done in my mind to improve the car is don't call it the e-tron calling the e-tron is a big statement in the same way that calling the original quattro the quattro was it's audi going this is us this is the future this is what we stand for and what this is in my mind is a q6 or a q5 electric if you will it's it's just not different enough to warrant that kind of name if you gave it something like a 500 mile range or a 400 mile range or you know some sort of crazy ability that no other electric car has i think that would justify putting such a bold stamp on the car and there is nothing inherently wrong with the e-tron the range is not great yeah it's better than than cars that have gone before but in 2019 or 2020 which is probably when this video is going to come out it just doesn't stand out and that's a shame because there's so much right about the car if you are the sort of person that likes to have a, a sort of medium to large 4x4 as a bit of a runabout and you don't have to do that many miles and you can charge at home quite easily you've got plenty of parking space and all that jazz then the e-tron probably is the right car for you but i certainly don't think this is going to revolutionize the industry thanks for watching everyone please like comment below Subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.